FM karko tafiko ina Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh um, welcome everybody on board today we're going to be speaking in english because uh, we want to go uh, get broader audience so uh, assalamu alaikum queen lucky barkan kida shugo wa aiko kara share video and please try to share this video is very important program today Um, like I know, I'm your host, Al Haji Africa. I'm coming to you live from Columbus, Ohio. You are watching me on African TV, Al Haji Africa on Facebook, or Charity Foundation on Facebook. You are getting me on uh, Al Haji Africa and Africa TV on YouTube, and also Al Haji Africa on TikTok. Um, I'm your host, and now uh, today we're going to be talking about the history of Hadith and its authenticity. And um, I would say. Uh, I'm with one and only Baba Shribe. He doesn't need uh, a lot of introduction. Most of you have seen him on Facebook. Um some of you have seen him on TikTok and uh, all over media. Uh, I'll be talking to him about on the city of uh, hadith and also uh, his take on hadith and uh, I have a lot of questions and uh, if possible we'll be opening the phone lines for a few questions before we end the show today. <laughs> Like I said, my name is Al Haji Africa. I'm your host. So without much ado, I'm going to invite him. He's going to come on board, and now we start the show as usual. Salam alaikum, Baba Shaiu. Wa alaikum salam, Haji Africa. Nam. Thank you. Thank you for giving me your platform. Nago uh, dekore. As you all know, I'm Baba Shaiu, the correctional officer when it comes to religious affairs, mm -hmm. uh, whether Islam, whether Christianity. Uh, what I try to do is to wake up the people from slumber, not to fall asleep because uh, there's a problem. Just like we have problem in politics and all, all other aspects of life, there's a problem in religion and also Islam in general. Okay. So we're good to go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my first question is, uh, we're looking at the history of Adith. So what is the history of Adith? How did Adith come about? Yeah, uh, before before we go we go to the notion of uh, Hadith, uh, people need to understand why Hadith and uh, yes, who who concocted Hadith? Where did Hadith come from? Actually, actually, if we have to deal with Islam, Islam, Islam goes with the Quran. Even though Islam didn't start with the Quran, Islam has been there before even Prophet Muhammad or. You know, if you go to Quran chapter 42, verse 13 to 14, Islam was the same given to No, given to Ibrahim, Musa, alayhi salam, and Isa, alayhi salam, before Muhammad. Uh -huh. I hope you can hear me sounding clearly. Yes, we are very, we are very clear. Yeah, both places on TikTok and on Facebook. Okay. So Islam didn't actually start with Prophet Muhammad, and neither is it that when we say hadith. When we say hadith, we are talking about discourse, narration, Uh, event, uh, a talk, it can be classified, but mainly the literal meaning is a discourse. Now, when we say hadith, it's an Arabic word which can be found in the Quran. If you go to Quran chapter 39, verse 23, God says, Allah will al hadith. If you go to uh, Quran chapter 52, verse 34, where God says, Fali hadith in in If you go to chapter 68, verse 44, there is hadith, al-hadith. So hadith has been in the Quran, which breaks down to discourse or narration. However, when we say the history of hadith, people are now talking about history of the hadith outside the context of the Quran, meaning not in the Quran, outside the context of the Quran. So what the scholars would define hadith to be is When they say hadith, these are based on the scholars, not according to God, because if we are going to base on what hadith is, according to the Quran, we will come to that, which is a different terrain to what the scholars are going to tell us what hadith is. So they will limit the hadith to be as the, the sayings of the prophets and the actions of what the prophet have done. This is what they claim. So they will say the hadith is what? Uh, the, the, the sayings and the actions of the prophet, and this I can say they are alleged reports of what the prophet and his companions have said or done combinedly. This is what the scholars claim as hadith. But then the problem arises. Hadith didn't start with Prophet Muhammad. If Islam is concerned, 
and people think Islam actually started with Prophet Muhammad. That's not the case. But let's assume people want to take their guidance from uh, the Islam from Prophet Muhammad now. Now, we have to first deal with the Quran because the Quran is the epitome of the faith. It is what decides what Islam is. Do you understand? That is for people who don't know Islam already preceded. Now, what people do is they will now want to follow hadith books which has a gap between what the prophet brought and what people are following, right? So the highest form of hadith books that people usually follow is uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, which is by Imam Bukhari. Right, so I will be giving the history concerning Imam Bukhari and how he came about writing hadith books, and which today scholars classify as part of Islam, which didn't exist at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. So the problem is, people uh, refuse to understand the Quran first before moving to the hadith. So what they do is vice versa; they want to add, understand hadith first before approaching the Quran, which is where the deviance all, 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 always starts. So instead of focusing on the Quran first to understand the language of the Quran and what the Quran has classified, they rather leave the Quran hanging, abandoned, and then down they go to their scholars to find out what the scholars have to say concerning the Quran. So just like you and I are talking right now, this is Baba Shraib sitting here, right? You want to know Baba Shraib, Will you rather talk to confront me directly or will you rather go to my family to ask them about me? They will only tell you their perspective about me. If I'm sitting here, I have to first talk to you first before you can take my words and go and ask my family to verify. Do you see how it has to go? But what scholars of today do is they will rather be the ones uh, when, when, when what, they will be rather be the ones to use their hadith books to actually say they want to confirm and to ascertain the veracity of the Quran, which is illogical. So coming to the breakdown, who is Imam Bukhari? Imam Bukhari is what we call was 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 the one was the first to create a methodological system for categorizing hadith using his stringent criteria for hadith approval. He classified each hadith as being what what we call sahih, which is what authentic. And classify some as Hassan, Mutawatir, when we say Mutawatir, something which is repeated, right? Yeah. Or in occurrence consecutively. But when we say Hassan, which is good, which can be used by the scholars, then they have the Ahad, which is a, an alone type of hadith, which you it is hard to trace the source, but then you can base your faith on. Then they have yeah. the if is what they classify as the weak hadith, which is doubtful. But some some scholars do use it. Then they have, and so on, and extra, etc. Then the, in the Hadith book, they have what they call Al-Qudis. Hadith Al-Qudis. According to the scholars, this is a sacred Hadith, or trying to say this is holy Hadith, which is also problematic. So they usually name it the 40 Hadith, right? Now, in order to go further, let's see who Imam Bukhari is. So Imam Bukhari, which he is a Persian. He is not an Arabian. He's a Persian. Now, what people fail to realize is they don't actually like to check the roots and sources of information before actually dealing with the information itself. In this modern day of journalism, when you are reading news from any other source, first of all, you have to verify the source of information and, and, and check the credibility of the one bring, bringing the reports. Just like God tells us in Quran chapter 49, verse 6, he says, if an immoral person brings you an information, you have to investigate. Now, investigation is very important, especially when it comes to matters of narration, right? Because people can just make up stuff and tell you stories which doesn't exist. Or it could be the scholar telling you the story. It could be from a doif hadith, but without you using your intelligence to investigate, you are in limbo. So now let's see who is Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari, by the full name Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, al-Bukhari is like a nickname given to him because he was born in the city called Bukhara, right? In modern day, we call that, that country Uzbekistan, modern day. No. But this is where he got the signature al-Bukhari because of Bukhara. Now, this Imam Bukhari, he is considered as one of the most distinguished scholars of hadith in Islamic history. His book, Sahih al-Bukhari, 
in which the prophet words, actions, habits were collected is one of the greatest sources of the prophetic influence in history. Now, this is the historical perspective, which I don't necessarily agree with, right? His full name is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari and was born in 194, the year 194 after Hijr. And when we say after Hijr, this is the calendar being used at the time of the prophet, right? We call it Hijr calendar. So after Hijr, 194 years, he was born. Now, what, what I want people to pay attention is when the Battle of Badr was fought at the time of the prophet, the Battle of Badr was fought, which is mentioned in Quran chapter 3, verse 123, and Quran chapter 8, verse 41, concerning how the parties met and fought. It was fought in the year, uh, second, second year after Hijr, 17 from Ramadan. If you bring it in the year of the common era, that is 13th March 624 CE, which is common era. So now, why am I mentioning this point? During the prophet's time, second year after Hijr, this Hijr calendar, now check how many years it took for Imam Bukhari to be born. 194 AH after Hijr, before he was born. So the prophet was dead and gone long time before Imam Bukhari was born. And now, Imam Bukhari born at that age, at that time. This is what happened. He was born in the city of Bukhara, like, like, like I said, which is now called Uzbekistan. One of the present cities of Uzbekistan, his father died when he was young. And he was raised as an orphan by his mother, who educated him well and had a role in sharpening his love and passion for science. As a child, he had a disease in his eyes which led to fears of losing his eyesight, but he was cured. He was highly intelligent as a child and had strong memory. Now, this is all part of the criteria of how Hadiths are classified. You have to have a good memory. You have to be a good character. You have to have a good sense of, uh, you know, not having mistakes in your speech and so on. So what happened was, and one of the qualities that helped him later in the collection of what prophetic words alleged and actions during his youth, he memorized the Quran and learned the basics of the religion. So I wonder where he learned it from. This is the biography, the history of Imam Bukhari. It is everywhere. Everybody, everybody can look it up. It is everywhere, right? No. Now, during his youth, which was at the age of 16 years, during this time, at the age of 16 years, he had memorized thousands of hadiths while he was still a young boy. So at 16 years, he started this endeavor of, of getting to hadith books. And I will tell you what inspired him. And remember, he never met the Prophet Muhammad. They never lived in the same era. No. Now what happens is, he had memorized thousands of hadiths, and he says while he was still 16 years, young boy. Then Bukhara's atmosphere at the city he was born, which was then one of the centers of science, also helped him because he learned a lot from other people. He attended the meetings with scientists and religious scholars frequently. Now, this is still history or biography of Imam Bukhari coming from other narrators. Now, going forward, the story of his authorship of Sahih al-Bukhari, the, the most popular Hadith collection book on earth today, Sahih al-Bukhari, how it started, which is the first classified book in the correct abstract and considered as a proof of eagerness, sincerity, and intelligence. It took 166 years of tough trips between countries. As for the trigger of the idea, Bukhari mentioned it himself, saying, I was with Ishaq ibn what? Rahawi. When he said, if you collected a brief book about the, if you will co collect a brief book about the pro, uh, correct norms of the Prophet Muhammad, the Messenger of God. So I liked the idea and started to collect Al Jama'a Al Sahih. Ibn Rahawi was one of the teachers and professors of Al Bukhari, right? One of the scholars of Nishapur. So he did not rush out to publish the book and made a lot of reviews, revisions, and investigations until he came out with the final version to, to include 7,000 
275 hadiths selected by Bukhari. That is the teacher helping Bukhari now. Out of the 600,000 that he received, so Imam Bukhari received also, some say, then he selected the ones which is okay for him. Now, where he worked hard checking the narrations in a strict manner, he set conditions to accept the story of the narrator of the hadith. He, Imam Bukhari himself, set the conditions. It wasn't prophet. It wasn't any companion of the prophet. He never met them. He is setting all these conditions. Who gave him the authority? We will come to that. He set conditions to accept the story of the narrator of the hadith, which is to be contemporary to those who narrated it and to have heard the talk of the out of the person himself in addition to trust, justice, discipline, mastery, science, and honesty. So the last part before I go into the history of the hadith itself, let me give you this part. Now, what people fail to realize is this guy started this at the age of 16. This endeavor, he started it at the age of 16, at a teenage age. It is said that Al-Bukhari collected over 300,000 hadiths and included only 2,602 traditions in Sahih. At the time when Bukhari saw works and conveyed them, he found them in their presentations combining between what will be considered Sahih, which is authentic, and Hassan, which is good, and that many of them include Da'if Hadith. So Imam Bukhari himself has to siva and take out some of the things he thinks are bad and some of the things he thinks are good. He's, this aroused his interest in compiling what Hadith whose authenticity, authenticity was beyond doubt. What further strengthened his resolve was something his teacher, which is Rahawi, Hadith scholar, even, that is Rahawi, better known as Rahawi, had said, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari said, we were with Ishaq al-Rahawi, who said, if only you compile a book of only authentic narrations of the Prophet. So this is where the inspiration of Sahih al-Bukhari started. Because he decided to take all the doif and everything aside and only focus on Sahih al-Bukhari. You understand? So the ones he, he has gathered, he only claimed they are the Sahih. And this is about 7,000 books, uh, uh, collections of hadiths, right? Which later on we have scholars like Imam Albani who even filtered it and, and saw the corrupt ones in the ones he classified as Sahih and Bukhari. So how did Bukhari got the inspiration to start collecting hadith books? He said what? I saw Prophet Muhammad in a dream and it was as if I was standing in front of him. In my hand was a fan with which I was protecting him. I asked some of I asked some dream interpreters who said to me, You will protect him from lies. Listen carefully. Imam Bukhari's inspiration was he saw Prophet Muhammad in the dream. Somebody you never met. You don't know how he looked like. You are not an Arabian, you are a Persian. You are claiming you saw him. I wonder which face or which picture he saw to make him think that is the Prophet Muhammad. But here he says, he, the interpreters of a dream told him that you will protect Prophet Muhammad from lies. So they are now telling us God is asleep. God cannot protect his own prophet or messenger after telling him in Quran chapter 5 verse 67, Wallahu yasimika minan nas. God will protect you or safeguard you from people. Now, this is what compelled me to produce Sahih. So this is what inspired Imam Bukhari. Now, we are finished with the history of Imam Bukhari. The veracity of whatever I said can be found on authentic sources on the internet. It's there. It is not an information I'm making up. Now, the second highest form of hadith classified in the modern day Islam after Imam al-Bukhari's hadith, Sahih al-Bukhari, is Sahih Muslim, who is also a Persian. He's not an Arabian. But I wonder how these people find the, the method of infiltration to infiltrate the world to make them think this Persian concept of book collections are part of Islam. I wonder. But let's see. So now, this Sahih, what do you say Sahih Hadith? It's a single narration conveyed by a trustworthy, completely competent person, either in his ability to memorize or to preserve what he wrote with a Mutasil, what do we say mutawasil, like a wasan, to have a connected chain of narration. 
And then there is not. That is the chain of narration. There is not. And then that contains neither a concealed flaw, like it shouldn't have a flaw or mistake in the, the you know, it's not. And then they have what they have, no irregularity. There should not be irregularity in the narration. And with something such as numerous chains of narration to back it up. Like for instance, let's say the World Trade Center was coming down and then we have BBC is narrating the same news, CNN, narrating the same news. And then we have Al Jazeera narrating the same news with consistency. This is how Hadith can be classified with, from scholars as being Sahih. But the Sahih Hadith, when we say Sahih Al-Bukhari, it didn't start with the scholar. It started with Imam Bukhari himself. He started classifying his own Hadith as Sahih Al-Bukhari. Then later on, we had scholars who came after him. Example, Imam uh, Albani, who also filtered out of the Sahih and threw some of to the trash. He rejected about over 5,000 hadith books from uh, hadith narrations from Imam Bukhari, which they classify as Sahih. He even rejected. Now, remember, coming after Imam Bukhari. Now, what is the criteria in which they classify? What is the criteria in which they classify this as, uh, how do you call it? They classify this as Sahih Hadith. So, the criteria in which we classify hadith as Sahih al Hadith. Yeah. Now, they say you have to have a good character, number one. Now, this criteria was something Imam Bukhari himself set the standards. Remember, he wasn't inspired by Prophet Muhammad. It wasn't Prophet Muhammad who asked him to do that. It wasn't any Sahaba who asked him to do that. It is his own uh, wishful thoughts and ideas. So he says you must have a good character. Number two, you have to have a good memory to be able to memorize things. Yeah. Number three, continuity. Uh, to have something we call continuity. To be able to have persistence in continuing something. Number four, you should have no flaws in the hadith. Number five, there should be no contradiction from that hadith to another hadith book. And meanwhile, scholars have over 600,000 hadith books. And I will tell you, the most popular Sahih al-Bukhari hadith out there, you can have from volume 1 to up to, I think, volume 9 or 10. Which, if you take three books, only three Sahih al-Bukhari books, it is more than the Quran combined. The Quran only has about 114 chapters, 6,236 verses. If you take only three of Sahih al-Bukhari book collections, uh, volume 3, 1, 2, 3, combined, they are more than the Quran. The pages in the Quran. Then imagine you have about nine volumes of Sahih al Bukhari, and then you have about eight or nine volumes of Sahih Muslim. You have about eight or nine volumes of Jamia Tirmidhi. By the time you finish learning Hadith, you are dead. And they claim these books are the ones explaining the Quran. This is where I have the problem. A book Prophet Muhammad never met the writer, Prophet Muhammad never prophesied about the writer. Prophet Muhammad never used it at his time. So the scholars now put in enforcing this kind of ideologies to people. First of all, who gave them the authority? Now, at the time of the prophet, God made the religion complete when he was alive. Chapter 5, verse 3, God says, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum, wa atmamtu alaykum nimati, wa raditu lakum ulam islam adina. He says, I have completed, perfected the deen for you, and I've approved my, what, uh, completed my blessings over you, and then I've proved Islam as a religion for you. So Islam was complete at the time of Muhammad. So if it was complete, where was the room for Sahih Bukhari Hadith? So now, Imam Bukhari himself was born a Muslim. Before he started collecting Hadith, which books was he using to practice Islam? Before he started collecting the Hadith at the age of 16. Where was he, where did he get the notion of practicing Islam? That is another question mark. Now, coming to this point, why do we need Sahih Ali? Why do we need them? According to the scholars, they say to provide proper guidance and in all aspects of what? A Muslim life, such as performing salat. So number one question you hear any Hadith follower asking somebody who doesn't agree with Hadith, they will say, how do you perform salat? We will come to that. And other act of worship. This is why scholars think we need Sahih al-Bukhari hadith or Sahih hadiths like Sahih Muslims and so on. But they forgot to realize that the Quran was to serve this purpose. 
Zalika al-kitabu la rayba fi hudan lil muttaqin Quran chapter 2 verse 2 that is the book wherein there is no doubt as guidance for those who are pious if you are a pious person the Quran is sufficient for you as a guidance Quran chapter 2 verse 38 when God told us to descend both Adam his wife and the uh, Iblis to descend from the garden to go away out of the garden he said his guidance he will send guidance from him to us if we follow the guidance we will never grieve or fear so the guidance of God has nothing to do with the book of Bukhari. Because, first of all, it wasn't God who inspired Bukhari. Bukhari only claimed that he saw Muhammad in his dream. How can you see somebody you don't, you don't know? You never saw his picture. You don't know how he looks like. You say you have seen him. It doesn't add up. Now, when you go to the Quran, chapter 17, verse 9, Surah al Israel. I'm going to say this before if you have any question to ask me, then you can ask me, Hajj. So chapter 17, verse 9, God says, Inna haza lo Qur'ana yahdi lillati hiya akwa. Wa yubashiru al-mu'minina al-lazina ya'amaluna salihat anna lahum ajran kabira. Now, in Arabic, when we say inna, we bring it in Hausa, we say lalli. This lalli is to emphasize the claim you are going to make, to place an emphasis on it, to make it tangible, to make it strong. So God says, Inna has the Quran. Indeed, this Quran, not that Quran, not their Quran, this Quran I'm reading to you, the one given to Prophet Muhammad, salam, this Quran guides to that which is more appropriate. So even if you have any form of guidance any other place, the Quran is the best book to guide you to more what is more appropriate. Then he says, Wa yubashiru al-mu'minina lazina ya'amaluna salihat and to give good news to the believers, those who, was, who act righteous, that is, who do good deeds. Indeed, that they will have a, a great reward. Now, what people fail to realize is the Quran is to serve the purpose of guidance. That is why Quran chapter 45 verse 11 says, This is guidance. So God has already given you the guidance in the Quran. But then you hear people, Oh, how do you, how, if you are going to follow the Quran alone, how do you know how to make salat? First of all, my question to you, the Hadith follower, have you finished studying the Quran? You haven't yeah. finished. So who told you salat is not in the Quran? And but as a matter of fact, at the time of the Prophet, salam, nobody ever asked him the question, uh, yes, I don't like to add salat. How will we do the salat? That question doesn't exist in the Quran. Are you saying the companions or the people at that, at that time, they forgot to ask him these questions? Because these are irrelevant questions. You need to know God before you start doing performing Salat to him. You don't know God. Why are you doing Salat? You are doing it for who? Because God says in Quran chapter 98 verse 5, he says, And he says, so in your thing, if you don't know God and how to serve God sincerely, your salat is useless. Your zakat is useless. What I encourage people is try to know God first. How do you know God? From the Quran. To, 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 to simplify this issue before we, we, we go to any other instance. Quran chapter 7 verse 33. God says, Kul, inna maharrama rabbi al-fawahisha ma zohara minha wa ma batana wal ithma wal bagiya bigayr al haq then he says, He taught us the messenger to say, say, My Lord only forbids obscenities. When we say fawahisha, it is the jamu, it is the plural form of what we call fahisha. That is in Hausa we say al fasha. Then he says, Mazahara minha, what is apparent thereof? What people can see. Any fasha, the, the job of our fasha, God has forbidden, shouldn't be apparent. God has forbidden. Then he says, What? And what is hidden? If it is hidden, God forbids it because you are alone. Then he says, Well, ifma, uh, well, ifma. When we say ifma, it is a deliberate sin. It is different from when we say you, are, uh, you are have zambi or you have uh, sayya. This if, uh, ifma is a, a sin you, you do deliberately, right? Then he says, well, and oppression without what? Right or without justice. 
And then he says, and to associate with God, with Allah, what he has not given you authority or send down any authority. This is haram by God. So anyway, people associating these hadith books, Sahih al-Bukhari books, Sahih Muslim, Sahih Jamia Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Sunana Ibn Nisa. This is, this is called shirk. Because in the first place, the authority doesn't come from God. Secondly, messenger didn't give you the authority. Prophet didn't give you authority. You just stand, stood up with your whims and desires and decided to attach these books to Islam, which is haram. Then lastly, and to say what you do not know about Allah, it is haram in Islam. But what do you find scholars doing? Always telling people what God never said. You understand? So, Hajj, this is where I stop before. If you have any questions, then we move on. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, you are listening to Africa TV and Al Hajj Africa on Facebook. On YouTube, you are listening to us on Africa TV. On YouTube, unfortunately, I'm trying to get back on TikTok and I'm having issues getting back on it right now. So, we just go with the. Uh, uh facebook right now until uh, if i'm able to fix that issue now um i'll be opening the phone line soon if anybody has any questions they can call, call in but my question here is um with the hadith now if you look at the um the story that you gave in terms of uh, how uh hadith, hadith was collected is it the same thing as the quran because quran was also accumulated like people collected it and put it together so it's almost the same thing like the hadith. So what's the difference? Okay, coming to that point. Mm -hmm. You see, the scholars who make such claims, yeah. there's a flaw and inconsistency in that claim. No. Right? Yeah. The criteria they use to follow hadith, they will tell you you have to know the mutawatir, you have to know the isnad, you have to know the, the mutasil, whatever, whatever, whatever. That criteria wasn't the same use for the Quran. That is number one flaw. That's a lie. Now, if you take the Quran, there is nothing like chain of narrations under the Quran where you see that it says this surah was transmitted to this and written by this and transmitted to this or someone had this. No, the Quran, you never find anything of that sort under it. But whenever you are quoting Hadith books, you will see on the authority of so so and so, narrated by so so and so, he heard so so and so saying, the, the, the Quran didn't go that way. Hold on. If you can go back on TikTok, I'll be nice. If you can send me an invite, I'll just pick you up. Yeah, yeah. So, someone who says the same process. So, what's the difference? It, it is not the same uh, process. I'm going to show you some, some flaws in there. With the Hadith narrations, first of all, you need authority. So, it goes by on the, on the authority of somebody and somebody and somebody. That is how they find the Isnad and the Mutawatir. This is how it goes. The Quran wasn't the same way like that. You never find any chapter in the Quran, like Surah al fatiha for example. You never find that Fatiha was narrated on the authority of so so and so and so and so, and it goes like that. No. And secondly, they have classifications. Classifications means when they take it, it's either Sahih, it's either they say Hassan, it's either they say uh, Kudisi, it's either they say this is uh, Du'if or Ahad, and so on. Quran doesn't have that kind. You never find Fatiha where they say this is Kudisi. Or oh, this is Hassan, this is uh, uh, Sahih. <laughs> so that argument is flawed. I, 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 after that, you will never find the, the, the chain of narrators, meaning, uh, like we say, somebody will say, I heard the prophet was talking about this chapter in this way. So I think this chapter has to be this way, not that way, unlike the Hadith books. The Hadith books, when you take the narrations, they differ yes. from each other. Even if they classify it as Sahih, they contradict each other. So I'll give you some examples. I made a, I made a video, it's called Dear Hadith Books, where I show the inconsistencies in Hadith book. According to the Hadith books itself, the Quran was written at the time of the Prophet, and it was complete. When he was about to die, it was complete, according to the Hadith. I don't believe in that Hadith books. The reason why when I say I don't believe, people shouldn't think, take offense and say, Believing is a choice. You can't force somebody to believe in something which is illogical to him. You understand? So faith, when because before you put your faith in something, you have to investigate it. You have to make sure, can I believe this or not? This is how faith works. You don't foolishly just get up and say, oh, I believe because Baba Shraib is saying it or because oh, I heard the prophet said it. It doesn't work that way. 
if we have to believe everything the hadith says, there will never be the if hadith. Then that means every hadith to be believable. Even Imam Bukhari himself, he rejected a lot of hadith. Imam Albani, he rejected a lot of hadith from say, uh, Imam Bukhari. You understand? And so on. And it goes till today. Tijaniya have some hadith they reject. Sunni, they have hadith they reject. Shia, they have hadith they reject. So who will they actually call hadith rejecter? But coming back to the point, I'm going to show you some flaws in the hadith book. Now, when you take, uh, for instance, Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim is the second most reliable hadith in the modern day Islam after uh, Sahih al Bukhari. Sahih Muslim 3004. In book reference, book number 55, hadith number 92. Right? Now, this can be found in the book of Zud and Softening Hearts. What is the hadith saying? The, in the hadith, according to the hadith, it says the prophet says, La taktubu anni, waman kataba anni gaira lo Quran, faliyamuhu, wahadisu anni. He says, Do not write anything from me. If you write anything from me other than the Quran, you should wipe it out, meaning efface it, take it out. Wahadisu anni. Now I'm going to show you that this, this inconsistency by scholars when they try to defend this hadith. When we say kataba, it means write. When you say had this, it means narrate by your mouth to say something. There's a big difference. Prophet says, do not write anything except the Quran. So if this is what he told the Sahaba or his people, they must have written only the Quran at his time. It is illogical to say the Prophet, the Quran was never written at his time. It's very, very illogical. If it is, if it is, Ill, the reason why I'm saying it's illogical why was the prophet given this command according to this hadith? He's telling the people not to write anything except the Quran. So meaning they wrote, right? So if they have written, and then he says, nothing except the Quran, then he gave them the authority, narrate from me. Now, what did he say they should narrate? Why didn't he say, and write from me? He could have said, you should write something from me. But he says, narrate. What is the narration? Alaj Africa, if I met you right now, we are talking. And I'm going to tell somebody that I was on Alaj Africa shows. A show. Must I go and write it as a book? If I want to narrate, I have to just go and tell. Oh, I was on a large Africa show. That's that's narration. I don't need to write it down. No. So if you listen to the Prophet's command carefully in Sahih Muslim three thousand and four, he says, "Do not write anything from me except the Quran." Now, according to the same hadith, I'm going to show you this contradiction here. According to the the, the same hadith books they have, we are going to see al Bukhari. In Sahih al-Bukhari, then we go to, uh, according to them, on his death, the prophet was, was on his death, deathbed when he was dying, right? So I'm going to show the inconsistency here. Sahih al-Bukhari, 5,669, uh, six, six, book number 75, hadith number 30. Now the hadith is saying, which was narrated by what? Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is narrating this hadith. According to the hadith, this hadith has been narrated by a lot of people before it goes to what? Ibn Abbas. No. And so goes with the narration of other people before Imam Bukhari got to write this. But listen to the hadith. When God's messenger was his on his deathbed, Madaji, and in the house, there were some people among whom was Umar bin al akhtar the prophet said, come, let me write for you a writing or something which you will not go astray. That is after the prophet died. He's telling them he wants to write something which they will never go astray. No. Then Umar said, the prophet is seriously ill and you have the Quran. So the book of God is enough for us. This is what Umar said. According to this hadith, he says the messenger is telling them to bring a paper so that he can write something for them. That thing will not make them go astray. So meaning the Quran wasn't enough to, 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 to protect them. Do you see the, the contradiction here? No. Now, if the prophet in Sahih Muslim 3004, he says, Meaning, wipe it out if you write anything other than the Quran. Then the same prophet who is about to die is telling them to bring a paper for him to write something. So, oh, the prophet can even write. He's telling them now to bring. And the scholars are telling you the prophet couldn't read and write. So now he can write, right? 
So he told them to bring. What did the Umar say? Umar said the prophet is sick, so don't mind him. We have the Quran, it's, it's enough. So, so many Umar knows that the Quran was complete, right? Because that is the only book the prophet God gave people authority to write. Quran chapter 2, verse 282. If God can inspire the prophet to tell the believers how to write depths, common depths, common depth, people are saying that the Quran wasn't written at the time of the prophet. Is that what they are telling us? No. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. The book of guidance for mankind, you say it wasn't written and it has to go through people's head. It doesn't, it, logic doesn't carry this along. So now, this hadith I'm quoting. Umar said, the book of God is enough for us. So meaning the book of God is there. The people present in the house defied and, and quarreled. Some said, go near to the prophet so that he may write for you a writing after which you will not go astray. While others said, Umar said, when they caused a hue and cry before the prophet, God's messenger told them to go away. He sacked them because he couldn't write the thing because they didn't bring the paper. So he got angry and told them, leave, leave here. Now what happens is, this same hadith, in the part of the hadith, narrated Ubaidullah Ibai, Ibai, Ibn Abbas used to say, it was very unfortunate that Allah's messenger was pre prevented from writing that statement for them because of the disagreement and noise they made. So he didn't write anything for them. So meaning, the Quran was complete. This is what Umar said. The Quran was there. They have the Quran. He said the Quran was enough. Assuming if the Quran was not complete, what would have Umar said? Umar will say, oh, Prophet, you are going to leave us without any complete Quran, anything written down. How can we survive? Yeah, you have to write it for us. Write something for us. Do you see the inconsistency? Now, the scholars wouldn't take the time to see the illogical claims. What they do is they follow their wishful desires and thinking in order to mislead the masses. So, Quran chapter 33, verse 67, Surah Al Ahzab. And the day of judgment, people will lament. He says, Kalu Rabbana, inna atana sadatana wa kubara ana fadaluna sabira. They will say, Our Lord, we have obeyed our masters and our leaders, but they misled us from the way. Because people only follow their scholars. You just obey them, you don't question. You don't use their intellect to, to, to re reason with things before following. They just follow as they are told. So the claim that the same way the Quran came to us is the same way the Quran is illogical and is a flawed argument. Now, uh, because of time's sake, let me go to the next question. Um, prayers. God, Allah told us to, to pray uh, in the Quran. It, there is no details in terms of how you pray. It's in the hadith. So how do you pray? So, so if, you don't, if, you don't, if you don't agree with the with the hadith, how do you pray? Good. Coming to this point, Hajj. The hadith books, there is no single hadith. And I'm throwing the challenge to any scholar watching. There is no single hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Jamia Tirmidhi, Sunan Ibn Nisa, which shows you how to do from Ikama. Huh? Ikama. When I say Ikama, when they are standing, they do uh, akbar, akbar, ashada, la ilaha illallah. From Ikama up to Salam, we don't have one hadith where the Prophet himself is teaching them step by step till the end. They don't have one hadith. What they have is they take chunks of hadith and join them together and they say here, I saw the Prophet standing one day, he did this, he was holding his hand and he did two rakats and he bowed down. He did, this is what he would tell you. There is not a single hadith which can show you salat from beginning to end. However, when you come to the Quran, what you find is there is a difference between prescription and description. The reason why scholars are telling you there is no details, they are details. Remember, Quran is a tafsil, a book which does the tafsil al kulla shay. Quran chapter 17, verse 12. It will take an ignorant person who claims he's a scholar to tell you that the Quran doesn't give you details of the salah. Quran has the details. But are they knowledgeable enough to know it? The answer is no. And I dare any scholar watching, they should come, let's have a live dialogue where he will prove the salat from the Quran A to Z, and they should come and prove their hadith, where the Prophet taught them how to do the salat. They claim in the hadith, the Prophet said, Sallu kamara aytumuni usallu. This is from the hadith book. The Prophet is telling them, pray as you have seen me pray. Arch, let's be honest. You sitting here, have you ever seen the Prophet praying? No. 
how can you pray the way he's praying? I mean, you can only tell him. You can only tell me that scholar said it. Mm -hmm. That's all. No, they never gave you any evidence. No, no person watching me right now can bring me a book where he says this is what I've learned from the prophet and he taught me. You can only see somebody's ESC. And when we say ESC, this is a, this is a, this is a delicate issue here. And when we say ESC, somebody's ESC, we are talking about something you heard through another rather than directly. You never saw the prophet directly pray. You only assume because somebody said he heard somebody say the prophet did this way. Do you see the point? When you come to the Quran, the summary of the Salat is found in Surah al Maryam, chapter 19, verse 58 to 59. It is all about standing, reciting the verses of God, right? And then bow down and prostrate and glorify God. That is the Salat. That is it. Somebody so saying, so there's, no, there's no rakat and there's no tayya. Quran doesn't mention rakat. The word rakat is not found in the Quran. Some scholars will tell you, oh, you can find ruku, you can find rakat. Are you knowledgeable than God? God will have said, do two rakat. Do three rakat. He will have said that. He never said that in the Quran. So if the scholars are claiming the epitome of Islam is the Quran before any other book, let's go to the first source. Does the Quran mention rakat? The answer is no. So where did they get it from? Who commanded them? Imam Bukhari? So do you do rakat or you don't do rakat? Do you do There's no rakat in the salat. So how Why would I do something which is not there? How many times do you pray? Three salats in the Quran. There's only three salat. salat. There's Salat al-Fajr, Salat al wusta and Salat al-Insha. Only three mentioned in the Quran by name. You find two, the name of two in Surah Al-Nur, chapter 24, verse 58. Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Insha. And then you find one in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 238. Salat al wusta There's only three Salats God has given. Right? And, and, and if we say rakat, rakat means you do two times or you do three times. So how many times do you do? So if you do... When we say rakat, rakat is the, the postures. How many repeated times you do the postures? Yes. You see the word raka'a. Raka'a is ruku. To do ruku. You know, when the people do salah, you see the ruku, the bowing down. So it is that, that posture you use to count how many raka'at. You understand? So in Quran chapter... 22 verse 77 god says he says what should you do right quran chapter 22 verse 78 uh, verse 77 so god says oh you believe what should you do so now this work on this scholars took to the form that oh it has to be consecutively so you have to do it repeatedly then they form the notion of raka'at God never asked you to do three, four, five. No, but it's your own accord. An imam is giving you salat, and he decided to go five minutes. You, the follower, are you going to go 10 minutes? No. No, you're going to go if, to the imam, yes. Exactly. So if imam decides to go two rakat, I'll follow him. I'll do two. If you go three, I'll go three. Because he is the leader. He's leading. There is no restriction in the Quran where God says you have to do two, three, four rakat only. If any scholar says there is, they should call right now and show you. So, so uh, I, I just want to make clear. So, how do you pray? That's what I want, I'm trying to see. Because how do you I pray? Gave you the, I gave you the summary, Hajj. I mentioned chapter 19, verse 58 to 59. It is described there as the prophet did. Salat is the notion of reciting the verses of God. Pay attention to the verses. Understand the message God is giving you. There's like God told you you are reading the quran reciting the quran to get the message from god and after that you can show your submission by prostration so it is the summary is found in quran chapter 19 verse 58 to 59 and quran chapter 17 verse 107 to 10 uh, 110 is found there so you it goes with the standing then you go down in a uh, bowing down uh, position, then you go prostration. Then the act of your glorification, the tasbih, the, the, the glorification, the subhanahu rabbi al-ala, subhanahu rabbi al-azim, they are all found in the Quran. 
Tabarak Rabb Ismi uh, Rabb Rabb Ismi Zil Jalal Wal Ikram. They are all in the Quran. You find it there. So these are glorifications you use to glorify God. You can call God for help. Istainu bi sabr wa salat. In your salat, you can seek for help from God. You can give glory to God. That is what we call obeisance. You call on God. You make the uh, prostration. You call on God. Does it? This is what salat is about. When you are ending your salat, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Does it? You are done. Now, now the five pillars of Islam is not in the hadith. It's not in the Quran. It's in the hadith. Do you believe in five pillars of Islam? Then that is a problem. If Islam, if Quran is the epitome of Islam, and you say it is not in the Quran, then that means some people have created a new religion where they find their own pillars there. Salat is in the Quran. Hajj is in the Quran. Zakat is in the Quran. Siyam is in the Quran. I mean the details. I'm talking about the details of how you do it. Every, every details is there. Hajj, I have videos. People who watch me, they know. I've done lectures where I break down everything. What do you so, want to kill? Hajj, so, so Hajj, when you go to Hajj, uh, if we go to Hajj and we go to Arafah, is Arafah in the, uh, in the Quran? Yeah, you are going to the Arafah. It's mentioned in the Quran. So, what is the, so you, you agree with everything that is done in Hajj? When you go not to every, no, no, not everything. So what do you, what is it that you don't agree with? I will tell you. No. Number one, the the procedure in which they do. God says we should do Hajj in uh in, in several months. Hajrul Ma'lumat. He didn't only give us one month to do Hajj. Neither did he say only ten days, right? They've limited it to only ten days, and you are containing millions of people at that place for this limited number of time. God in his infinite wisdom in Quran chapter 2 verse 197. He gave you several months to do Hajj with it. That is number one. I don't agree. Number two, the procedures where they force people to, to go and kiss the black stone, to go and worship the black stone. Some people will say we are not worshipping, but that is worship. I can classify what worship is. When some people don't kiss it, it's as if their world is ending. According to God, they should give you the chance to enter into Kaaba. To see what is inside. They don't give you. They don't give you a chance to enter. But they give the prince and the uh, authority, authoritative people to enter there. There's Sefa wal Barwa in the Quran. There's Kaaba in the Quran. Right? There's Arafah in the Quran. You can go all these places. But however, they are limited. They are not as much as the things have been added there. They're going to drink Zamzam. Zamzam is not mentioned in the Quran. It's the formulation idea of the people just to sell for marketing purposes and get their, their money. But, but Zamzam is not really part of the Hajj anyway. Zamzam is kind of like a symbolic thing where people go and they drink. It's not know. in the Quran. Okay. No, I understand that, but it's not really part of the Hajj. But um, Kalma Shahada is, it in, is in the Quran. Uh, when we say kalimat is shahada, it's, it's an Arabic word. It means the word of witness or no. the word of bearing witness. When we say shahada, it's to bear witness. No. Bearing witness is found in Quran chapter 3, verse 18, where God himself, he bear witness of himself. He says, shahid allahu annahu la ilaha illa huwa. Then he says, wal malaikatu wa ulil ilm qa'iman bil kisti. Then he says, la ilaha illa huwa azizul hakim. So when we say shahida or shahada, it is to bear witness of something you have seen and you can witness. Somebody will say, why are we saying ashadu Allah ilaha illallah? Have we seen God before? Yeah, you saw God before coming to the earth. Quran chapter 7 verse 172. And you testified in front of him that he is Lord, your Lord before he brought you to the earth. Somebody can say, I cannot remember. Okay, when you were born, when you were six months old, one year old, can you remember whatever you did? The answer is no. Somebody still has to remind you. So now God is telling us in the Quran 3 verse 18, the, kalim, the only kalima to shahada you find in the Quran is to bear witness that there is no God but Allah. But I keep telling people, if you say ashadu anna, wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, you are a hypocrite. Somebody who says wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Abdu wa Rasul is a hypocrite. The reason why I'm saying that you are saying you bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger. I'm not saying don't believe in Muhammad. You can say Muhammad or Rasulullah. But if you say Ashadu, you should understand the implication of the words you're using. 
You mean you bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger. Were you there? Have you seen Muhammad when he was assigned as a messenger? No, you are only reading a book and you believe in the book. Believing is different. If you go to a courtroom and they ask you, were you a witness when Muhammad was a messenger? And you say, yes, they will slap you. You, go, you might go 10 years in jail. You never saw it. How did you become a witness? You can only say you believe he's a messenger of God. Amana Rasulu bima unzila ilahi mi rabbihi wal mu'minun. Kullun amana billahi wa malaikati wa kutubi wa rusuli. Lanu faruku bayna ahadim mi rusuli. I can believe he's a messenger. I don't need to bear witness. I'll be hypocritical if I bear witness. Do you know the reason why, Hajj? Even the people who, met, who were at his time, Surah Al-Munafikun, chapter 63, verse 1, God says they are liars. You cannot bear witness. Were you there? Some people will say he received the messengership in the garden of Hira. It's a lie. He never received any messengership in the cave, according to the Quran. No. Some people will say bear witness uh, means, you know, uh, belief during that time. Because, you know, no. no. Look, choice of words. Words are very powerful. That is why we say kalima. Words are powerful. If you are using words and you're trying to let it mean what it doesn't mean, it means you are, you are concocting your own meanings. Now, the reason why I say you don't have the right to say you bear witness, Quran chapter 4, verse 79. God says, wa arsalna ka nas rasulan wa kafa billahi shahidan. We have sent you as a messenger to mankind, to all people. And God is sufficient as a witness. So now, if God is sufficient as a witness, who are you to bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger? Does God need your witness? Were you there? How did you witness that he was a messenger? Now, what people don't understand is some people will quote Quran chapter 13, verse 43. They quote it out of context, and I'm going to help out on this channel. Those who disbelieve, they say he is not a messenger. They say, you, Muhammad, you are not a messenger. Then God says, Kul, kefa billahi shahida God is sufficient as a witness between you, uh, me and you. Then he says, Woman in Dahu ilmul kitab. Now, this woman in Dahu ilmul kitab, it is not attached to God. It is rather attached to baini wa bainakum. So this kum, the people who disbelieve, as well as whoever has knowledge of the book, God is a witness between all these ones. It is not saying God is a witness as well as whoever has knowledge of the book. No, this is flawed argument. If you have knowledge of the book, God is still the witness because he sent Muhammad. He only saw Muhammad. You weren't there. You didn't see how Muhammad became a messenger. He only sent him. He's, he's telling you to give credence to the book by investigating it. Quran chapter 4 verse 82. Afala yatadabbarun al-Qur'an. Yours is to investigate the book Muhammad brought, claiming to be a messenger. You cannot say you bear witness. What made you a witness? How? Let, let's look at something else too. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to go to the five pillars of Islam. Uh, zakat. Do you, pay zakat. Do you pay Zakat? First of all, we need to understand what Zakat is. Right? When we say zakat, it's the act of purity. It's something you do to, to get purity. You understand? So I'm going to give you the, the, the understanding there of when people can understand why you, you say you give zakat. When you go to Surah al Layl, chapter 92, verse 17 to let's say uh, verse 21, right? Surah al Layl. He says, What's that? Then he says, Then he says, Now to understand what zakat means, the word zakat is an ism, it's a noun. But when we bring is the zakka or zakka, it's, it's a verb meaning to purify something, to be pure. Now, what you, people need to understand, anytime something is mentioned, try to know the roots and the aspect or the, 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 the know the sources and roots of that thing. Now, zakat is something, the money you give or the helping hand you give 
in order to purify your own soul. Yeah. So in these verses I read, chapter 92, verse 17 to, to let's say, 21, God says, and then the most pious will what? Will, will, will be saved from it. No. Then he says, You give your money, you give your wealth in order to purify yourself. That is the concept of zakah. Then he says, You are not giving so that the person will come and do you a favor. You know, we have people who give charity so that they will say, Oh, you are not doing it. You are doing it for the sake of God. So he says, you are only seeking the countenance of your Lord Most High. This is the concept of zakah. Giving zakah is a human act for humanity that every human being, if you really know God, you have to do it. Zakat is the money you give to the poor in order to purify your own soul. That is zakah. Is there in the Quran? So always you see God telling you, "Akimu salat wa atu zakat." Why do you do this? You only do the inna hasanat use hibna sajiat. You only do the good deeds in order to wipe your bad deeds away. That is why the salat and the zakat they go hand in hand usually because you have to do both together. It's not only about calling on God, but you should know how to help humanity as well. So this is the zakat. Now, so you don't have any percentage on the zakat like we have percentage. There's nothing like percentage in the Quran. Quran chapter, uh, let me see if I can give you the verse. Quran chapter 17 verse 24 yeah verse 24 to verse 25 right it only depends on you according to god he says then he says maharum. now in your wealth you yourself you know your salary you know what you are capable of you know at the end of the month what you can take from your own wealth to give somebody now what people don't understand is they think there's a percentage look if god wants to tax you tax you no none of you can pay now i'm going to quote a verse before you ask me the next one in surah to muhammad quran chapter 47 then you go to let's say verse 36 to verse 38 i'm going to uh, give the explanation in english god says the worldly life is only a play and amusement but if you believe and reference god that is revere he will give you your rewards and will not ask you for your assets or your money God never need money from you. He is never taxing you for anything. So I don't know where people got the notion of percentage. God is taxing you for what? Now, verse 37. If he should ask you for your wealth or for your money, then it will restrict you to become stingy. If God is going to tax you, you become stingy. And it will bring out your hatred because you hate God. You're like, oh, what kind of God is taxing me? Just like some of the Christians do. They say you have to come and pay your tithe. Come and pay your 10%. Come and pay your this percent. Verse 38. Here you are, those who are invited to disperse, to spend in the way of God. That's why we say, What you, you are capable of giving. What you can give. Then he says, But among you are those who are stingy. And whoever is stingy is only stingy to his soul. For God is the rich while you are needy. And if you turn away, he will repla replace you with other people, then they will not be the likes of you. So it is not about percentage. God never asks for percentage in your money, but you know how to give and what your capability of giving is. So to summarize this, according to Quran chapter 3, uh, let me give this verse, Quran chapter 3, verse 92. Yes. Lantana birra. hatta you can never attain righteousness till if you can give from what you love. Haj, you understand this concept, right? So if I give money from what I love, it is my own accord to choose what I want to give. Not something I can disdain or look down on. No, something I love, I can use to give. But it doesn't mean a percentage. No, God is not taxing anybody. Now, if, um... Like I said, um, let, let me ask you, when somebody died, what we go to in terms of ritual, um, the burial, the uh, uh, prayers during the burial, you know, the hours that we're supposed to bury, most of them is not in the Quran. So how do you, how do you, do you do that? Like if, if a family member is dead or something, 
what 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 is the right way that you think is supposed to be done in the Quran? No problem. First of all, the notion of burial. Remember, according to the same scholars and the Hadith books, they claim the Prophet's parents were dead when he was born. He was an orphan, right? So the question is, how were they buried? Does it have an impact on the on the dead body? How does it help the dead body? What does it change in the livelihood the person have left, the legacy the left, the person have left? Does it impact the person going to hell because of the burial? Okay, let's check the example. When we go to Quran chapter 5, verse 27, remember the two sons of Adam, one killed the other, but it was a bed who taught the other one how to bury the dead body. Remember, the one who was killed was a good person. The one who killed the dead body was a bad person. But at the end of the day, it was a bed teaching him how to bury the body of his brother. So I want people to understand the notion of burial. Christians can bury, Jews can bury, Indians know how to bury. The burial doesn't impact on the death of that bereaved person. No. The point is, you need to know how to give respect to the dead. But it doesn't change anything from his actions and deeds that he did towards God. So now taking you back to Quran chapter 5, verse 27, when you read down was like 31. The bad person who killed this person is the one going to bury this person. And it was a bed teaching him how to bury. Because the body, the soul is gone. So the bed, body is just trash. You are only going to bury it so that it doesn't become a problem for the, those living on the earth. That's why we, we find cemetery and go and bury the dead. Now, you burying the dead, there's nothing you can do to save that dead person from whether if he's going to hell or paradise. There's nothing you can do to impact his life. I give an example. Quran chapter 16, verse 28 to 29. According to God, if you are a bad person and you are dying, the angels will give you dirty slaps and tell you where you are going. Whether hell, they will tell you where you are going already before the angel takes the soul away. There's no concept of bringing it back in the grave to question you, my Rabbu Kama, do you get? No. Then again, in the same chapter, chapter 16, verse 32, the angel, if you are a good person, he will tell you if you are going to paradise. Already tell you before taking your soul away. So, Haj, tell me, somebody the angel has already given dirty slaps, according to chapter 8, verse 15. They gave him dirty slaps front and back and told him you are going to hell. And now we have his dead body. We want to go and bury. Uh, bury. We, we showered him. Remember, somebody going to put under the sun. You are showering him. You are bathing him. You, you dress him nicely. You, you wear makeup, everything for him. Let's say you, you give him that respect. You put him in the, the coffin. You went and put him in front of people. You say you are going to pray for him. What are you going to do? Intercession. You are going to intervene. According to God, chapter 39, verse 43 to 44, the intercession, all intercession belongs to God entirely. You cannot intercede for anybody except God. Now, you put him there, you say you are going to pray so that God will do what? Forgive him. After the angels gave him dirty slaps before taking his soul and told him that he's going to hell. So according to the Hadith, now Hadith books is making us think that when you pray for the dead, you are going to save the dead from God after already giving him dirty slaps and telling him you are going to hell. You are now going to tell God, God, forgive him. He, to, to do what again? To change the, the after God telling you Lamu Kelmati, his word doesn't change. You are going to hell, this doesn't change. So, what prayer are you going to do for the dead to save the dead again? There's not no prayer. So, for me, look, even if you be dead and burned, they will cremate your body. God will bring you on the day of judgment. According to Quran chapter 17, verse 49 downwards. Even if you become stones, he will judge you on the day of judgment. So it doesn't matter how you are buried, so far as you are buried in a respectful manner. I approve that. But it is not the Quran who has to now tell you how to bury the dead. How was the prophet's father and mother buried? That's the question. Did they have to wait for the Quran to come? No. Now, okay. You are listening to uh, Africa TV and al Haji Africa on Facebook. You are also getting us on YouTube on uh, Africa TV. Uh, you're also getting us on TikTok on al Haji Africa. Now, uh, I have a question here. So we are talking about the history of Hadith and its authenticity. Uh, you can give us a call at 614-598-2714. And we want to stay on uh, on the program so we can we shouldn't divert in, uh, with other stuff. Now, um, my question is, um, a lot of people, when they listen to you, they have the notion that, uh, or, or maybe the perception that maybe you, you don't like the prophet. Because Hadith 
is the life of the prophet. That you don't like the you don't like the prophet. That's why he's saying this. So what are you going to say about that? Yeah, as you see, uh, I keep telling people when you listen to uh, somebody reading a text or lecturing you, always, especially when it comes to matters of religion, leave emotions aside. If you are emotional, you can't handle it. If I hate the prophet, I will not use the Quran. Number one, he brought it. Number two, when you are telling people the truth, you always sound like the hater, the, the one who hates something. Whilst forgetting that those who are emotional are the ones who, who are letting the truth sound like hatred to them. I've never done a lecture where I insulted the prophet. I've never done a lecture where I'm against the prophet. As a matter of fact, if I'm against the prophet, I will never even read the Quran. I will put it to trash if I hate the prophet. But the reason why it sounds like hatred to people because they are emotional. They don't take their time to listen. How is it that I have respected, respectable, respect, uh, respectable people over all the world listening to me? How is it that those people will waste their time listening to me if I was the one hating the prophet? I didn't know Muslims. Why do they listen to me? You understand? The point is, when people hate your message, they have to now accuse you of something you haven't done. When I speak about the prophet, I try to distinguish and take away the trash attributed to him and that is why people think I now hate him. Hajj, I just gave you the history of Hadith books. Let's be honest. Imam Bukhari, has he met the prophet? No. I gave you the history of Imam Bukhari. Well, did he have permission from the prophet? No. Oh, good. I gave you the history of Imam Bukhari. Has he ever lived with the prophet? No. Good. Now, scholars don't tell people this. When I come in between to distinguish between the narrations and the prophet of God, they claim I'm the enemy of the prophet. Why? Because something you've been lied to, to think they are combined, I'm now separating them to tell you they are not combined. This person doesn't have the authority to write the biography of this man. The first person who wrote the biography of Prophet Muhammad, his name is Muhammad Aslam ibn Ishaq. He never met the prophet, but he wrote the biography of the prophet. Hajj Africa, we all came from Nima. You have been in Nima before. I was born in Nima. You know me, and now we are talking. But if I ask you to write my biography, Hajj Africa, if I don't tell you, you don't, I don't tell you emphatically, can you write 100%? No, but people will say maybe I, I can go over there and ask people about you. Speculations, assumptions. First of all, they are not the ones who give birth to me. They can only assume certain things about my personality. Remember, Hajj, the way my parents know me is different from the way outsiders know me. Do you agree with me? Yes. Good. And the way my wife knows me is different from the way my brother knows me. Do you agree? Yes. Perfect. Now your friends, you can put two of your best friends on that one table. Ask them their point of view about you. I swear to God, it will never match up. Two of your best friends, put them on the same table and ask them to give you their point of view about you. They will never match up. Some things they will agree, some things they have different views, perceptives about you. So coming to the biography of somebody, first of all, I need to be the one to tell you about me. Then you can go and ascertain from an authentic source, maybe my father, my brother, my sister. This is how it works. But you don't go to outsiders. What if they hate me? How will you know? What if those people you are going to, they hate me? How will you know? Do you see my point? No, I see your point. In order for Imam Bukhari to be able to give you the authentic history about Prophet Muhammad, he must have met somebody who has seen the Prophet and is a family member. Has he done that? The answer is no. Now, so what do you think that the hadith wrote about the prophet that is is trash that it is not it's not true if you can give just few examples mm -hmm. they say it is part of sunnah and this hadith it differs some hadith will say nine years some hadith will say six years some will say even she was 18 years now these are this is the confusion in hadith books now yeah. if you claim the prophet marina nasisius okay is a sunnah the first question is is it in the quran no no verse, single verse in the Quran, which claims the prophet married a CCS with girl. Secondly, the name Aisha is not in the Quran. Thirdly, 
according to the Quran, Prophet only married women, not girls. Women, Nisa, not girls, not a bintu. Or does he say it must say a fataya or something? No. Thirdly, people are approving such statements. This is that an example I'm giving you. I'm becoming to a delicate hadith where the hadith is insulting women and alleging it to the prophet. I will quote it right now for you. Now, this hadith goes, we have a lot of inconsistencies and hatred against the prophet himself. There's an hadith book claiming, hadith, hadith narration claiming the prophet wanted to sleep with somebody behind his wife. There's hadith narration claiming that the prophet is saying that people who will be taken from hell and put in the paradise, they will be called al jahannamin They will be they will be called al jahannamin means people of the hellfire are now in paradise. According to them, the prophet says you should set salawat upon him. So the prophet has now become an idol. You have to devote your deen to him. The prophet himself said in Quran chapter 18, verse 110, Then he says, So if the prophet says, don't associate anyone in the worship of your Lord, and you devote your time, you say Friday, anything you want to do, Salat al Nabi. Every time, Salat al Nabi. And then, Sheikh Samuel Maluma way, oh, Salat al Nabi, Akwebi and Bukata. So people are idolizing the Prophet without actually paying attention. Now, Hajj, let me coach this, let me coach this hadith where you can see these blasphemous sayings in this hadith. Yeah. According to Sahih al Bukhari, 304, book number six, hadith number nine. Narrated by Abu Said al khudir He says, once the messenger of God went out to the musalla of the idol Adah, he is going to pray. Then he passed by the women and said, Oh women, give charity, give alms, as I have seen that the majority of the dwellers of hell were you women. So according to this hadith, he's saying women will be a lot in hellfire. And some scholars obviously believe this. <laughs> I'm surprised. Then he says, they ask, why is it so? God's messenger said, he replied, you curse frequently. He says, women curse people frequently and are ungrateful to your husbands. He's telling women they are ungrateful to their husbands. And I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence. He's telling the women they lack intelligence. This is the Hadith book, Sahih al-Bukhari. And religion. He says, women are weak in deficiency in intelligence and religion than you a cautious sensible man could be led astray by some of you he's accusing women of being devils to mislead people the woman asked oh allah's blessing what is deficiency in our intelligence and religion he said is not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man they reply in affirmative meaning they approve yes he said this is the deficiency in her intelligence. So according to him, the reason why God says two women should bear witness, it means she lacks deficiency. Is that what God says? No. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses? The women replied in the affirmative. He said, this is the deficiency in a religion. What do you mean by this? This is in Sahih al-Bukhari book. And I quote the reference for you. And anybody is saying, oh, it's like, I have the Hadith books, all the volume of Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Jamiat. I have the full volumes from volume one to verse nine. I check it myself. I read it myself. I've been to Madrasa. I've studied Kala Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I've studied Hadith books myself. Right? Now, these are the books claiming they explain the Quran. Now, tell me which verse of the Quran does this book explain? This Hadith I just quote. Which verse of the Quran? I dare any scholar to come out and show me which verse of the Quran this narration explained now this is what i do and they say i'm the enemy of the prophet i'm only defending the prophet from the lies being attributed to him this is my job the reason why i call myself correctional officer it is to lead to teach the intelligent people to the truth in religion i'm not here to convince people with emotions if you are emotional you can't listen to me i only deal with the truth and you say if i'm lying come let's sit down one on one and get your ass roasted 
Now, uh, so uh, my next question to you is, um, so this is one of the examples of the, uh, what do you call it, of the things that you think that uh, the Hadith is saying about Prophet that is wrong. Uh, I would say this is some of the things. The foundation of the Hadith itself, mm -hmm. I can strike it down. It doesn't stand the test of time. Do you know why? Number one, Hadiths need an authority from the Prophet. Ask any scholar, where did the Prophet give the authority for Sahih Bukhari books to exist? It doesn't exist. That's number one failure. Number two, who gave the authority of classification that this is Sahih, this is Da'if, this is Hassan, this is Kudusi, who gave the classification? The Prophet doesn't know about this. That is a flawed argument, number two. Number three, the rules they put up, the isnad and everything, the chain of narration, these rules are not coming from the prophet. It wasn't the prophet who gave them this criteria to check all these books. So if in the hadith books you can have du'i, uh, you can have lies there. And God is now telling you in the Quran, according to God, you can never find contradictions in the Quran. Ask any Hadith follower, can I find contradictions in the Hadith? They will tell you yes. So it's obvious one is not from God and one is from the people. Hadith is from the people and they are trying to put it in the deen of God. So now, to simplify this question you just answered, ask Quran chapter 45, verse 6 to verse 8. God says, Tilika ayatullahi natluha alayka bil haqq. God says, these are the verses of God which we recite to you in truth or with the truth. In which hadith, in which hadith, narration, discourse, talk, event, conversation, translate it as whatever you want it to be. In which hadith after Allah and his ayat? The question is, the books of hadith, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, are they the ayat of God? The answer is no. So in which hadith after God and his verses will they believe? So now the question is to you and I. Am I going to say I believe in Sahih Bukhari? Did the prophet give me Sahih Bukhari? No. Sahih Muslim? No. So who gave me? The scholars. The ulama, they give us these books, not the prophet. Then verse 6, uh, verse 7, afim. Woe to every sinful liar. Who are those? The ones who are going to defend the hadith, right? Yesmahu ayatillahi. He didn't say yesmahu sahih Bukhari. Yesmahu sahih Muslim. Yesmahu ayatillahi tutula alayhi. Hajj, you and I, I'm reciting the verses of God to you from the Quran. It wasn't from any other book. So God says, Thumma you see rumors, takbiran. Then he insists arrogantly, arrogantly, yasmaha, as if he has not heard the verses of God. Then God says, For Bashiruhu be azab and alim, and give me give him news of a painful punishment. So now God is asking me, in which hadith after God and his verses will I believe? And I said, only the Quran. And you said, I'm a kafir, I hate the Prophet. So are you telling me the Prophet wants me to believe? In Sahih Bukhari Hadith, how to Quranakum? I'm waiting. Do you get the logic here, Haj? That is my stance. Wow. So, uh, so you mean you don't believe in um, Salatu, Salatu to, uh, to the Prophet, like the way they say, Salallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma Salallahu Muhammadi, and all those stuff. Yeah, it, it, is a, it is a misconception. And it's a mistranslated verse, chapter 33, verse 56. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuwa allazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu tasliman. They lie to the people. It doesn't mean what they made it mean. You understand? Let me tell you how it works. Okay. They are making you say salat ala nabi, right? What does it mean, salat ala nabi? The scholars will tell you, you are sending peace and blessings. First of all, the word salat doesn't mean peace. No. Salam means peace. Salat doesn't mean blessings. Ba baraka. Huh? When you say baraka or barak, that is what it means, what? Blessing in Arabic. So the word salat doesn't mean blessings. 
So they will say, peace and blessings be upon the prophet. You have been, people have been duped. This is why anything you are asked to do, find a source first. Now, let's assume it is peace and blessings be upon the prophet. Now, God says, Inna Allaha wa malaikatahu so God and his angels, they send peace and blessings upon the prophet. Let's assume that is the, the case. Mm -hmm. Then the scholar says, you, O oh, you who believe, you have to also send peace and blessings upon the prophet. Now, this is, this is the illogical part. How do people send peace and blessings to the prophet? They will come and then now come to the salat and then they will say, Allahumma. Sunni ala Muhammad. Wala Ali Muhammad. Oh, the last time I checked the verse, it didn't say Ali Muhammad in the verse. It only say in Allah Malaikatu Isaluna Al Nabi. Yeah, you are Lazina Amanu Salu Alehi was Sunni Mutaslima. It didn't say wa alihi in that verse. So let's assume it is about the Prophet. Where did the Wa Ali Muhammad come from? That is number one problem. Number two. God already said he and his angels are sending the blessings. If you mean sending blessings, they are already sending blessings. You came again, you are telling God, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. The illogical part is, if God already is sending blessings, why are you now telling God again, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. God, send blessings again to Muhammad. God is already doing it. He only told you, Ya you are lazina amanu, sallu alayhi. People don't understand what sallu alayhi means. This is the act of support to reach out to the prophet, support him. It is talking to the believers at that time, not at our time. Have you met the prophet? How do you send blessings to a person God has already approved? It is obvious to you and I that prophet Muhammad is going to Jannah. What blessings does he need from you and I? We rather need blessings from him. People have misunderstood the verse because Hadith is telling them otherwise. They believe the Hadith, not the Quran. Quran chapter 9, verse 103. The prophet was asked to do the salli alayhi to the believers. It has nothing to do with sending blessings. Do you get my point? Quran chapter 33, verse 43. He, God, has already been doing it for the believers. It is not about sending blessings. It is about reaching out, supporting believers, or support the prophet, reach out to him. So it is not about to send blessings. What does the prophet need your blessings for? Hajj, to simplify this, we and the prophet, who is more blessed? He's, he's the one who is blessed. So who deserves to send the blessings to each other? Yeah, he sends the blessings to us. Simple. I'm only telling people, the correctional officer is not here to be a preacher. I'm only here to lecture the intelligent people to the truth in religion. If you're willing to follow the truth, put emotions aside, Check the text. I will help you to scrutinize everything you have been taught. If any scholar says I'm misleading the people, I'm available for a dialogue. Thank you. Now, uh, if somebody is trying to convert to Islam, what is the process? Since yeah, you're thinking about Sahara is different from what people, people know. So what do we do? What is the right way to do it? Number one, Shahada doesn't make a person a Muslim. If anybody thinks if you say shahara, it makes you a Muslim, that is a flawed argument, right? A Christian can just get up to say ashadu, Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu, anna muhammadan abdu wa rasulu. What makes him a Muslim? Quran chapter 2 verse 8. Wa min an nas man yakulu amanna billahi wa bil yawmil akhir wa ma hum bimu'minin. People who say we believe in God and the last day, but they are not believers. Your acts, your actions, your hearts, nobody knows but God. How do you become a Muslim? We saw Ibrahim alayhi salam, Quran chapter 2, verse 131. When God told him, Aslim, he said to God, Aslam tu, the Rabbil Alameen. You have to submit your will to God. What you need to ask anybody who wants to be a Muslim is, do you want to submit your will to God? Yes, I do. He will now practice what God asked him to do. The Quran is the word of God. Give him what God says. Is he willing to submit? Yes, he's willing to submit. This is the criteria of what makes a person a Muslim. You don't become a Muslim by just saying a word. It doesn't exist. So God says in Quran chapter 2, verse 284, right? He says, Lillahi ma fi samawat wal ard. 
wa in tubudu ma fi anfusikum aw tuqfu yuhasibukum billah then he says fa yaghfir li man yasha wa yu'azzibu man yasha wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir he says to god belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth and if you should manifest whatever is in your bosoms or you want to conceal it god will, will bring you to reckoning he will bring you to account for it so a person can just come verbally and say ashhadu alla ilaha illallah he is not a muslim that doesn't classify you as a muslim if it was a muslim god will have told us in the quran that people would do it as a matter of fact you never find in the quran where it say ashhadu alla ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah I'm not saying if you say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is wrong no if you say ashhadu in front of the Muhammad and ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad and that is what I say it is wrong because you never bore witness when Muhammad was a messenger but if you say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasul there's nothing wrong Quran chapter 48 verse 29 Muhammad Rasulullah is mentioned Quran chapter 37 verse 35 La ilaha illallah is mentioned. So if you say la ilaha illallah is found in the Quran, Muhammad Rasulullah is found in the Quran, but say ashhadu. Who ask you to do that? Prophet never ask anybody to say ashhadu. It doesn't exist in the Quran. Remember, the Quran is hidden in nas. It's a book of guidance for the people, not for the Arabs. And if it's for the Arabs, who is Imam Bukhari? Was he an Arab? No. Imam Muslim. Say he Muslim. Was he an Arab? No. They were Persians. So is it is it a Persian who has to write a book to tell me what Islam needs to be done? Now, uh, my my question here is: we've we've have a lot of uh, imams and uh, scholars saying that um, if somebody is going to die and they say because you are saying we shouldn't say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they are saying that if somebody is going to die, he does the shahada, he gets pardoned. So what, what what is your um take on that? That is a, another misconception. If you go to Quran chapter 10 verse 90. Now listen to the statement. Hajj, you said the imam said the scholar said if you are going to die and you say what? The shahada. Shahada yeah now. That you go to what? You go to the pardon. You go to the pardon. Okay, let's check let's check if this can stand the test of time. Chapter 10 verse 90 Fir'auna Fir'auna the time of Musa alayhi salam Quran chapter 10 verse 90 What happened when he was attacking the children of Israel and they parted the sea and they were going he chased them in the middle of the sea to catch them when he reached there God made the sea came together right this is what he said He says qala amantu annahu la ilaha illa allazi ahmanat bihi banu israila wa ana min almuslimin then god told him in verse 91 alan today now wa qad asayta qabl wa kunta min almufsidin is it today you will come and say la ilaha illallah is, is it today you come and say ashhadu alla ilaha illallah you were with us where did the scholars get, get this concept from faro faraun was dying he said listen what he said qala amantu amantu i believe annahu that la ilaha illallah that there is no ilaha except the one amanat the children of israel bihi banu israila believe wa ana min al muslim that i am of the muslims he said this do you know what god told him now so you wait till you are going to die who told you that so let me debunk this claim quran chapter 4 verse 17 to 18 This is what God says. It doesn't hold when you wait till death comes before you are going to become a believer. It doesn't work. According to God, inna ma a tawbatu ala Allah lilazina ya ya maluna su bi jahalatin. Then he says, "Thumma yatubuna 
min karibin. So the, 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 you have to what? Repent before. Then he says what? For ulaika yatubu alayhi. You have to repent whilst we are still alive. Meaning you have to do it before. You don't have to wait till death come before you say you repent. It doesn't work. Then God says, "What can Allah alimun hakim?" Now listen, what the two he doesn't accept. Well, uh, then he says, "Walaisati taubatu lilazina ya maluna sayyat." As for those who do who repent, those who are doing what bad deeds, hatta iza hadaral ahadahum lmaut. When death comes to one of you. You have been doing the sins when death comes. Now you are going to say, Kala, in me, tuptu, tuptul an. Is it now you are going to repent? Wala lazina yamutuna, wahum kufar. No, those who die while they are disbelievers, or those who wait when the death comes before they say they, they have repented, God will not accept this. Quran chapter 4, verse 18. He will never accept that. So if you have done all the sins, you haven't done the good works, you waited last minute, last show, you want to now come and say, la ilaha illa shara, la ilaha illa la. No, no, Hajj, it doesn't work. Uh, I have a question. Somebody has a question on uh, Facebook. He's asking, uh, how do you perform Ramadan according to the Quran? How do you what? Perform Ramadan according to the Quran. Oh, it's, it's, it's very easy. I I have the full lectures. I've done the full lectures, but it's very easy. You can find how to do Ramadan in Quran chapter 2, verse 183, 184, 185, 186, 187. It's mentioned the concept of Ramadan there. Ramadan is the month, the name of the month. Sharul Ramadan is the month where the Quran was revealed. You find it on the Arabian calendar, which is the Hijr calendar. It is the ninth month, right? And we are having it, I think, in about two weeks' time or so. Now, that month, what you practice in that month is the siyam. So siyam is the abstinence. When we say abstinence, it's not only about food and water. So people will call it fasting. I will not say only fasting. It is abstinence. Now, Quran chapter 2, verse 183, God says, Ya yu al-lazina amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam, kema kutiba ala al-lazina min kabalikum. Then he says, La Ask the majority of the people, why do you fast? They don't know. You only do abstinence so that you may attain what? Piousness. It gives you taqwa. Remember, the Quran is to serve the purpose of guidance for those who are what? Muttaqin. So, Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, the siyam is to help you to have piousness. To get closer to God. So you will learn how to abstain to, from certain things God has forbidden you. It is a, like a practice to help you become a good person. So God has what? Prescribed. So when you say kutiba, kutiba comes from the word kataba. So God has already written, getting, it's, it's prescribed for us in the Quran. So we find it there. So when we say siyam, it is abstinence. You avoid from drinking water, eating. You abstain, abstain from sexual act, immoral act, any act that can make you corrupt. You avoid that. The food and the water is the notion of refraining you. You are in the pious state. It, it, is, it is the beneficial is beyond the imagination. Right? Now, to do the siyam, I'm going to explain in Quran chapter 2, verse 187. Now, God says you have to eat and drink during the night time. When it's dark, you can eat and drink. You can sleep with your wives. You can do anything you want with your wives during the night time. Then from dawn, when you see the white thread in the sky, huh? when it's dawn, you know when Fajr, Al-Fijr, if out of the world, Fijr, the white beard. No. When it comes out, you stop eating or you stop anything you want to do. Then now you are going to start the siyam, the abstinence. So you are going to abstain from lasting after your wives. You are going to abstain from eating, abstain from drinking, and any other act that can corrupt you in terms of your pious act. So you stop that. Now what happens? You are going to do the abstinence throughout the day until what? Night. 
So God says in the chapter 2, verse 187, he's telling you what to do. Now, what people fail to realize in that verse is, God says, Thumma atimus yama ilalayl. So you conclude. When we say atim, it comes from the word tamat, like tamam, to complete something, to make something fulfilled. So God says you should complete the siyam, this abstinence, complete it at what? At night. He didn't say at magri. God in his infinite wisdom didn't say al ilal magri. He says what? Ilal layl. And layl is the dark, darkness time, when it's very dark outside. It's getting dark. So uh, that is the time you break your fast, the abstinence. That is the simple form of siyam. So there's no notion of any extra things they keep telling you, unless if they want to mention about when you break your fast, you have to pay. There's nothing like you have to pay makeup for other days. There's something we call fidya to ta'am in miskin as a what? Ransom. This fidya, if you cannot do the siyam and you are struggling, you can ransom it by feeding a poor person. And that is enough. There's nothing like you have to wait after Ramadan, then you do some other days. No. Chapter 2, verse 184. I have full breakdown on my YouTube channel. Whoever is interested can get it. Um, let's look at it again. Um, with his explanation that he was explaining about, uh, if in what the case, if you want to elaborate a little bit on what he was trying to, to say, so that you understand it when it comes to uh, the prayers. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. maybe he had it wrong and maybe others also had it wrong. Yeah. Exactly. The claim is, uh, you know, what I what I want people to do is when they are listening to me, especially the correctional officer, I want you to listen attentively without emotions so that yes. you know where I'm coming from and where I'm going. The, when I mentioned the notion of the Salat, I said there is no one single hadith existing in the Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim or anywhere which shows the Ikama from Ikama up to the Salam of Salat in its entirety which is taught by the prophet what the scholars do is they go to the chunks of hadith books and take part 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 narrations from people's ESC and mm. join them and say this is the salat so if they claim the hadith narrated by abu dar in their sahih al-bukhari hadith he went that the prophet went to the sky to go and bring salat to them the five salat according to that hadith if he brought five salat there is no salat al jumaa there there is no salat al eid there's no salat al uh, janaza inside the five salat he went to bring. But let's assume he wanted to bring that. When he brought it, it didn't show the number of rakat he brought in that hadith. According to Nanaisha, when he brought that salat, it's two, 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 two rakats. Mm -hmm. Then it later on became four, two, uh, three, and, and so on. How did he change from this to this? After, according to the hadith, after God says, La mubaddilan kalamati, that his words does not change. But then he changed to something else. So, however, to give it the benefit of the doubt. People think that the Salat they've been praying five times today and doing two Rakat Fajr, four Rakat Zuhu, four Rakat Asr, three Rakat Maghrib, four Rakat Isha. They thought all these things has been taught from beginning to end in the one Hadith book. It doesn't exist. It is just chunks they join together to make you think you find guidance in the Hadith. They are not there. So I urge you, I encourage you to investigate, study, to know what the scholars teach you before you put your faith in there. Quran chapter 17 verse 36, it says, He says, says, Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. Indeed, the hearing, the eyesight, and the mind, all those will be answerable, questionable thereof. So beware. Now, uh, before we, we, we call it a night, somebody wants you to explain the meaning of Allahu Akbar. Uh, Allahu Akbar, I've done a video where I explain the meaning. When we say Allahu Akbar, now, if if you say Allahu and you add Al in the middle mm. and then Akbar, yeah. you are putting it in a superlative form, which is uh, what we call uh, Sigatul Tabdil. You are putting a preference in praising God, right? Now, mention, remember, you mentioned Allah. When we say Rabb, you can say Rabbul Akram, Rabbul Ala, uh, Rabbul Zal Jalali Wal Ikram, Azawajal, or whatever you want to put for the Rabb. But when it comes to Allah, there is La ilaha illallah. When it comes to the godly aspect of God, the moment you say Allah wa Akbar, you are giving him a preference in terms of comparison. It becomes a comparative word because you are saying Allah is the greatest, greatest of which gods, because there is only one God, Ilahun Wahid. 
So if it is alone, he calls himself in the Quran, Quran chapter 13, verse 9, he calls himself Al Kabir. Al Kabir sees the argument. He says, The great, the magnificent. It seals the argument because we know after God, nobody can be greater. No. Al Kabir. But the moment you say, God is the greatest, number one, you say, Allahu Al Kabir. What is the comparison there? Is there another Ilaha next to him? So why are you calling him Allahu Akbar? Greatest of who? Example, if I tell you, Messi is the best, meaning they've already compared him with another good player or somebody better than the good player before saying Messi is the best. If Messi is alone, why will he say Messi is the best? Best of who? If there's no other footballer on earth and you say Messi is best, logically it doesn't sound. He has to be good, alone. You understand? So the, the notion of using Akbar, God never said in the Quran, when you come to do Salat, you should call him, you should praise him, Allah Akbar. No, no, he doesn't exist. So it is people who formulate these ideologies and not coming from God. And then they keep saying Allah Akbar. According to God, Quran chapter 17, verse 111, God says, Wa kabiruhu takbira. So if you say Allah Kabir is enough, there's no Akbar. Kabir is enough. You see, but then the scholars they will tell you Akhtabir. When they use Akhtabir, they are telling you to use the Akbar, which is not from God. So yeah. we have somebody. Well, let's take the last call on the line. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, who is calling? Uh, my name is Alaj. I'm calling from New York. From New York. Bismillah. My question is, I just wanted to. Uh, tell us how he does his salat because I, I heard him from the beginning but I really did not understand I wanted to read to re say it again no I've already explained that okay. yeah but I wasn't it wasn't clear to me honestly okay if you want the clarity I have a full video where it explains that because I don't want to repeat myself I have a full video if you want I can give you the link where you can find a full video of how I did the salat how the salat is done I was the link you go to my channel, Bush 2G9. Type on your this thing, Bush 2G9. Bush 2G9. Yes. Then you say you search Salat Tutorial. Salat Tutorial. Salat you will see my video right. on my page. Yes. It's a full video, 20 minutes video, which tells you from the Salat from beginning to according to the Quran. All right, no problem. If I find any difficulties, I'll try to reach out. Yeah, no problem. You can reach out. Yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Salam alaikum. Uh, before we end, somebody's asking this Quran 7 bit verse 11 or something. Oh, let, me, let me see who is called. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Okay, they hang up. All right, somebody's asking Quran 17 verse 111. It says, What does that mean? In the end of the verse, God says, Wakabiru takbira. Wakabiru takbira. You have to magnify no. him with takbir. So when we say takbir is to say Allah al kabir. If you say kabir is enough, Allah al kabir is enough. You don't know, need to say Allah akbar. You understand? So chapter seventeen, verse one hundred and eleven, the last part of the verse, it says wa kabiruhu. You need to magnify God by takbir, not not Allah akbar. No, not in the superlative form. You have to use kabir. That is enough. So God Himself, He called Himself in the Quran Al Kabir. He never called Himself Allahu Akbar or uh, uh, Akbar. No. Okay. Uh, uh, Salam alaikum. Inka, inka, tell me question. Come back. I can share with the Sahaya. Bismillah. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Baba, uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, Salam alaikum. Okay, Najishi. Okay. The caller was asking that the Quran did he came down all at once or did he come by step by step, like yeah. gradually? So the answer is found in Quran chapter 17, verse 105 to 106. God says, Wabi Haki, Anza then he says, 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 Then he 
ala nasi ala muksi wanazannahu tanzila so god says and we have revealed it in truth and it descended in truth and we have only sent you muhammad as a missionary and a warner then verse 106 together with a reading which we have separated so that you may read it to the people in order to remain for it to remain among the people and we have revealed it as a revelation right so to sum to summarize that answer in quran chapter 25 verse 32 the disbelievers at the time of muhammad this is the question they ask they were asking why this is color color lazina kafaru laula nuzila alayhi al-qur'ana jumlatan wahida kazalika linuthabbita linuthabbita bihi fu'adaka warattalnahu tartila god says and those who disbelieve they say why was the quran not revealed to him all at once like at once like a book at once to him then god says thus so that we may reinforce your mind for adaka with it and we have revealed it and uh, we have intonated it with what chanting in intonation like mm -hmm. to be to be articulated in a form which it will be easy for people to comprehend so that is the point the quran didn't come to him all at once it came gradually by chapters and then it was separated and then it's combined as a book. Okay. Do you understand him? Okay. Kajai. All right. Okay. Yeah, now, now, that's all no, correct. Now, I understand very correct. And you're going to let me tell you what you're going to let me tell you. Uh, 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 Okay, Munguri, Kore, I am the shame of the sire. Wait, no, 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 yeah uh, i've heard his question the caller is asking about surat al masad he says abila and according to the sectarians, yeah, so they have the yeah. telling them that there's somebody called Abu Lahab or Abila, right? Mm -hmm. So they have a narrative aspect, which is away from the Quran, telling them something which has nothing to do with the Quran in the first place. So when we say surah, a chapter, mm -hmm. a chapter is a subdivision division work, usually numbered and titled. So mm -hmm. the name of the chapter is called Masad, which means a fiber, right? Now, when you read the chapter, God says, Tabbat yada abihi lahab wa tabba. Now underline the word lahab. Lahab. Underline it. Mm -hmm. Now check the word abi. You hear the sectarian say abu. There's a difference. Even though this scholar did well, he said abi. Now let's use the abi. We are going to check something. Remember, the Quran is to serve as a clarification of all things by itself, not somebody else, not something else. Quran chapter 16, verse 89. Mm -hmm. So the Quran, the book, the book, the Quran is in the book. It is to serve as a clarification of all things. Mm -hmm. Right? So now we are going to see that clarification. Underline the word lahabi, watabba. So God says the handwork of Abi Lahab uh, has been destroyed and he will perish. Now we are going to find who is this Abi Lahab. Is it the you know the entity they are claiming in their hadith books or is it an entity we can find in the quran let's check verse 2 ma agna anhu malu wa ma kasab his wealth we neither avail him nor what he end right then verse 3 sayasla naran zata lahab now the word lahab has been repeated in verse 1 there's the word lahabin huh? with kasrat that yeah. same lahabin has been repeated in verse 3. Mm -hmm. Lahabin, in Arabic, this is a three-letter word. Now, mm -hmm. this lahabin, it means flame, or you can say flames. That is the word lahab. That's what it means. So, yesla, this yesla means to be burnt. 
So yes, la naharanzata la. He will be burned in the fire, possessing what flames. Mm. So this flame. Now we will be coming to verse one to understand who it is. Then verse four. Wamuratuhu hamalatam So and his wife. When we say wamura amrat is woman, somebody's wife is wamurat amrat. So and his wife will be the carrier of the firewood, right? Then verse five. Fiji diha. Hablun mi masad. So around her neck, or we can say in her neck, or around her neck, hablun mi masad. There is a rope of what fiber will be around the neck. So now the question arises: Why will God dedicate a whole chapter to an entity, and the entity is nowhere to be mentioned in the Quran? So let's check the word abi. When we say abi, it means the father, or we can say in English, we can say the don. When we say you are a father of something, it means you are the head of all when we say you are the father of the house it means you are the head of the house including your wife and everybody. do you get the point so yes. when we say the father the moment we mention the word abi lahab we translate it literally as the father of what flames mm -hmm. so the word lahabin is flame now who is the father of flame who will be the boss of the flame on the day of judgment Quran chapter 7, verse 11 to 18. It tells you Iblis will be the one to lead the people to hell. Some people will say, ah, is it talking about Iblis? We are going to check. Remember, Iblis has a Kabila. He the devil. He has a Kabila. And Kabila is called what? Clan. Clan mm -hmm. is only related by blood. Yeah. By marriage. Now, you, the, the gene, you as the human being, you have a family. The jinn also has a family. They have descendants. According to Quran chapter 18, verse 50, the jinn has descendants as well, just like Adam also has descendants. Now remember, God is saying, beware of the devil because he is the worst enemy. He wants to lead you to hell. Now the devil, according to this verse, he is the Abihilab God is defining to us. Somebody will say, how did the devil, how was he able to attain? How was he able to attain wealth? Quran chapter 17, verse 64. According to God, God is telling the devil, The devil can have money as well. He also has money. And the devil has women. He has horses. He has everything. Just like you are thinking, as well. because remember, the gene and the human beings were created to serve God. They know what is called pleasure. They also procreate. They also have descendants. Just like you, human being, having descendants. So when you check the context of the verse, the word Abihilab here, the father of flame, throughout the context is only attributed to Iblis and his wife, not to an entity outside the Quran. Number one, he, uh, Iblis, is the top notch of disbelievers for God to dedicate an entire chapter to him. Instead of going to dedicate to an Arabian who is not even near to the epitome of what Pharaoh did. And no. then you claim he is the one mentioned in this chapter. No, I beg your pardon. That is not Abu Lahab, according to the Hadith books. This is talking about Iblis himself, the punishment he will have on the Day of Judgment. Thank you. Now, we can't understand you, Shai. I understand, I understand. I understand. Nkaoka, it's so kazo kazo kutata wana kikio. Kadi. Eh, one love, little. Eh, slowly. Ah, come on TikTok, kapos ko kodi ka endi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Disconnect. This is not bashing. Inshallah. So what we do is we will find time because it's a lot of people are requesting that we need to come back again. So we we'll find time and come back again because a lot of people are requesting that they they need to come back again. Uh, we, I need to bring you back again. You know, yeah, no we, problem. We we can arrange that uh, in the. Yeah, we'll arrange that later, and then we'll talk about it. So, uh, so I think I, I I would like to thank you very much for coming on. But is there anything that you forgot to add before we we call it a, a night? Uh, actually, let me let me see if I can add up this advice to people concerning uh, what I represent. Actually, no. I will advise people so much so that please leave emotions out. Leave, I know sometimes it's hard to accept something you have no experience in, or you you cannot phantom. The greatness of what is being told to you i understand you yeah. but however if you give me the chance 
I know most experience when they watch me, they say, wow, this guy is smart, he's brilliant, he's smart, whatever, whatever. Not only my smartness. I don't use my smartness to teach people foolishness. No. Mm-hmm. I use my smartness because it's a gift, God-given gift. So I lead people to the right way, the right way mentality, the right way to think. Remember, if you can put your blind feet in scholars, you think they will lead you to paradise, then think twice. They are never going to lead you to paradise because they are interested in your money and not your faith. So think twice. Your salvation is more important to you. You must know your salvation depends on you. The way you reason with things, as God told you in Quran chapter 17, verse 30, says, Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. So if you have been praying five times, ask yourself, where is the evidence? If you say you are a Muslim, what made you a Muslim? How did you become a Muslim? What makes you think you are qualified to be a Muslim? What if I call you a mushrik? You think I cannot prove it? I have the evidence to it because I can see it. When somebody goes out to steal, what does it become? A thief. When somebody regularly goes out to rape, what does it become? A rapist. When somebody goes out to actually fraud people, what does it become? A fraudster. So when I make lectures and you see me calling people mushriks, I have the evidence. Even in a courtroom, I can stand the test of time. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My point is just to wake up the masses and to know that we've been put in a deep hole and we need to wake up. So this is where I drop my point and then hope to see you again another time, inshallah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming on and having patience and for us to discuss it. We'll bring you back. It was a lot of people I say we should bring you back. So we'll yeah, find inshallah, time, I'm, I'm, time and come back and then, uh, you know, Take care of other areas that we haven't touched yet, so that we'll give people chance. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm open to every question. So you can give chance to call and people, people to call and ask questions. So those yeah. who don't, those who don't agree with you, they also need to come here and and, and call and ask questions because simple. They, they always say that and they don't even come and call. So no, if, simple. If you know, yeah. just come on board and call. Exactly. My last point, uh, uh, Africa. even uh, with Ayuba who called, Ayuba is like a brother to me, or I would say a big brother. He's a friend, he's a big brother to me, uh, he's a close person to me. We've spoken a lot of times. It is not a must for you to agree with me in everything. You see, at a point when you ask him that, oh, you'll bring him, he says, oh, no, I don't have that knowledge to, to argue with Baba Shua. It's not as if he doesn't know, or he doesn't know I, I don't have knowledge, or I have knowledge. He knows I have knowledge. But the point is, it is not a must to agree with everything a person says. No. We all have the intelligence to decipher and examine things we want to follow. Nobody is forcing anybody. But whatever claims I make, I can prove it. But the question is, my opponents, when they make claims, can they prove it? Let's find out. That's why I'm called a correctional officer. Thank you, Alaji. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I, appreciate and I, want, I would like to thank all my viewers for coming on board, those who are watching us on YouTube. Facebook, I'm very sorry for uh, those on TikTok. We'll make sure next time we'll make sure we get it right. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for coming on board. Like I said, uh, with, I also want to thank my guest, Baba Shribu, for coming on board and having patience. Thank you, thank you Ash. Thank to explain everything to us. Uh, thank also the callers, those who were able to call in. I want to thank all of them for coming in. And the last one for my viewers, I have Baba Sidu, I have Jimmy Salis, I have um, Sister Rashida, I have all those who I have, Christian Chris from Albania, is a good brother to me, a good friend as well. I have a lot of viewers who watch, I know they are watching, and I thank them for their support. All those watching and those who are not here who watch later, both my lovers and my haters, thank you all. I know you watch later, so thank you. I appreciate <laughs> the support and your presence. So, Haj, this is where I leave you for now. Yes. I appreciate the, the, Thank the, you very much. Thanks, my viewers. So I really thank everybody who came on board. Thank you very, very much. My name is Alahaji Africa, coming to you live from Columbus, Ohio, United States. You have a great night, depending on where you are. You have a great night, and I will see you guys on my next program next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.